Chapter Two, Part Three, of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume One, by John Fox, edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter Two, The Ten Primitive Persecutions, Part Three. The Eighth Persecution under Valerian, Anno Domini 257. Began under Valerian in the month of April 257, and continued for three years and six months. The martyrs that fell in this persecution were innumerable, and their tortures and deaths as various and painful. The most eminent martyrs were the following, though neither rank, sex, nor age were regarded. Rufina and Secunda were two beautiful and accomplished ladies, daughters of Asterius, a gentleman of eminence in Rome. Rufina, the elder, was designed in marriage for Armentarius, a young nobleman. Secunda, the younger, for Verinus, a person of rank and opulence. The suitors, at the time of the persecutions commencing, were both Christians, but when danger appeared to save their fortunes, they renounced their faith. They took great pains to persuade the ladies to do the same. But disappointed in their purpose, the lovers were base enough to inform against the ladies, who, being apprehended as Christians, were brought before Junius Donatus, governor of Rome, where Anno Domini 257 they sealed their martyrdom with their blood. Stephen, bishop of Rome, was beheaded in the same year, and about that time Saturninus, the pious orthodox bishop of Toulouse, refusing to sacrifice to idols, was treated with all the barbarous indignities imaginable, and fastened by the feet to the tail of a bull. Upon a signal given, the enraged animal was driven down the steps of the temple, by which the worthy martyr's brains were dashed out. Sextus succeeded Stephen, a bishop of Rome. He is supposed to have been a Greek by birth or by extraction and had for some time served in the capacity of a diacon under Stephen. His great fidelity, singular wisdom, and uncommon courage distinguished him upon many occasions, and the happy conclusion of a controversy with some heretics is generally ascribed to his pity and prudence. In the year 258, Marcianus, who had the management of the Roman government, procured an order from the emperor Valerian, to put to death all the Christian clergy in Rome, and hence the bishop with six of his deacons suffered martyrdom in 258. Let us draw near to the fire of martyred Lawrence, that our cold hearts may be warmed thereby. The merciless tyrant, understanding him to be not only a minister of the sacraments, but the distributor also of the church riches, promised to himself a double prey, by the apprehension of one soul. First, with the rake of avarice to scrape to himself the treasure of poor Christians. Then, with the fiery fork of tyranny, so to toss and turmoil them, that they should wax weary of their profession. With furious face and cruel countenance, the greedy wolf demanded where this Lawrence had bestowed the substance of the church, who, craving three days' respite, promised to declare where the treasure might be had. In the meantime, he caused a good number of poor Christians to be congregated. So when the day of his answer was come, the persecutor strictly charged him to stand to his promise. Then valiant Lawrence, stretching out his arms over the poor, said, These are the precious treasure of the church. These are the treasure indeed, in whom the face of Christ rhymes, in whom Jesus Christ has his mansion place. What more precious jewels can Christ have than those in whom he has promised to dwell? For so it is written, I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. And again, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. What great riches can Christ our Master possess? than the poor people in whom he loveth to be seen. Oh, what tongue is able to express the fury and madness of the tyrant's heart? Now he stamped, he stared, he ramped, 
he fared as one out of his wits. His eyes like fire glowed, his mouth like a boar formed, his teeth like a hellhound grinned. Now not a reasonable man, but a roaring lion he might be called. Kindle the fire, he cried, of wood make no spare. Has this villain deluded the emperor? Away with him, away with him. Whip him with scourges, jerk him with rods, buffet him with fists, brain him with clubs. Just as the traitor with the emperor, pinch him with fiery tongues, gird him with burning plates, bring out the strongest chains and the fire forks, and the grated bed of iron, on the fire with it, bend the rebel hand and foot, and when the bed is fire hot, on with him, roast him, broil him, toss him, turn him, on pain of our high displeasure, do every man his office, O ye tormentors. The word was no sooner spoken, but all was done. After many cruel handlings, this meek lamb was laid, I will not say, on his fiery bed of iron, but on his soft bed of down. So mightily God wrought with his martyr Lawrence, so miraculously God tempered his element the fire, that it became not a bed of consuming pain, but a pallet of nourishing rest. In Africa the persecution raged with peculiar violence. Many thousands received the crown of martyrdom, among whom the following were the most distinguished characters. Cyprian, bishop of Carthage, an eminent prelate, and a pious ornament of the church. The brightness of his genius was tempered by the solidity of his judgment, and with all the accomplishments of the gentleman, he blended the virtues of a Christian. His doctrines were orthodox and pure, his language easy and elegant, and his manners graceful and winning. In fine, he was both the pious and polite preacher. In his youth he was educated in the principles of gentilism, and having a considerable fortune, he lived in a very extravagance of splendor, and all the dignity of pomp. About the year 246, Poecilius, a Christian minister of Carthage, became the happy instrument of Cyprian's conversion, on which account, and for the great love that he always afterward bore for the author of this conversion, he was termed Coecilius Cyprian. Previous to his baptism, he studied the scriptures with care, and being struck with the beauties of the truths they contained, he determined to practice the virtues therein recommended. Subsequent to his baptism, he sold his estate, distributed the money among the poor, dressed himself in plain attire, and commenced a life of austerity. He was soon after made a presbyter, and being greatly admired for his virtues and works, on the death of Donatus in Anno Domini 248, he was almost unanimously elected bishop of Carthage. Cyprian's care not only extended over Carthage, but to Numidia and Mauritania. In all his transactions he took great care to ask the advice of his clergy, knowing that unanimity alone could be of the service to the church, this being one of his maxims, that the bishop was in the church and the church in the bishop, so that unity can only be preserved by a close connection between the pastor and his flock. In Anno Domini 250, Cyprian was publicly proscribed by the Emperor Decius, under the appellation of Coecilius Cyprian, Bishop of the Christians. And the universal cry of the pagans was, Cyprian to the lions, Cyprian to the beasts. The bishop, however, withdrew from the rage of the populace, and his effects were immediately confiscated. During his retirement he wrote thirty pious and elegant letters to his flock, but several schisms that then crept into the church gave him great uneasiness. The rigor of the persecution abating, he returned to Carthage, and did everything in his power to expunge erroneous opinions. A terrible plague breaking out in Carthage, it was as usual laid to the charge of the Christians, and the magistrates began to persecute accordingly, which occasioned an epistle from them to Cyprian, in answer to which he vindicates the cause of Christianity. On two hundred fifty seven, Cyprian was brought before the proconsul Aspasius Paturnus, who exiled him to a little city on the Libyan Sea. On the death of this proconsul, he returned to Carthage, but was soon after seized and carried before the new governor, who condemned him to be beheaded, which sentence was executed on the fourteenth of September, 
Anno Domini 258. The disciples of Cyprian, martyred in this persecution, were Lucius, Flavian, Victoricus, Remus, Montanus, Julian, Primelus, and Donatian. At Utica, a most terrible tragedy was exhibited. Three hundred Christians were, by the orders of the proconsul, placed round a burning lime kiln. A pan of coals and incense being prepared, they were commanded to either to sacrifice to Jupiter or to be thrown into the kiln. Unanimously refusing, they bravely jumped into the pit and were immediately suffocated. Fructosus, bishop of Tarragon in Spain, and his two deacons, Augurius and Eulogius, were burned for being Christians. Alexander, Malchus, and Priscus, three Christians of Palestine, with a woman of the same place, voluntarily accused themselves of being Christians, on which account they were sentenced to be devoured by tigers, which sentence was executed accordingly. Maxima, Donatilla, and Secunda, three virgins of Tuburga, had gall and vinegar given them to drink, were then severely scourged, tormented on a gibbet, rubbed with lime, scorched on a gridron, worried by wild beasts, and at length beheaded. It is here proper to take notice of the singular but miserable fate of the Emperor Valerian, who had so long and so terribly persecuted the Christians. This tyrant, by a stratagem, was taken prisoner by Sapor, Emperor of Persia, who carried him into his own country, and there treated him with the utmost unexampled indignity, making him kneel down as the meanest slave, and treading upon him as a footstool, when he mounted his horse. After having kept him for the space of seven years in this abject state of slavery, he caused his eyes to be put out, though he was then eighty-three years of age. This not satiating his desire of revenge, he soon after ordered his body to be flayed alive, and rubbed with salt, under which torments he expired, and thus fell one of the most tyrannical emperors of Rome, and one of the greatest persecutors of the Christians. Anno Domini 260, Gallienus, the son of Valerian, succeeded him, and during his reign, a few martyrs accepted, the church enjoyed peace for some years. The Ninth Persecution under Aurelian, Anno Domini 274. The principal sufferers were Felix, Bishop of Rome. This prelate was advanced to the Roman seat in 274. He was the first martyr to Aurelian's petulancy, being beheaded on the 22nd of December in the same year. Agapetus, a young gentleman who sold his estate, and gave the money to the poor, was seized as a Christian, tortured, and then beheaded at Praeneste, a city within a day's journey of Rome. These are the only martyrs left upon record during this reign, as it was soon put to a stop by the emperor's being murdered by his own domestics at Byzantium. Aurelian was succeeded by Tacitus, who was followed by Probus, as the latter was by Carus, this emperor being killed by a thunderstorm, his sons, Carnius and Numerian, succeeded him, and during all these reigns the church had peace. Diocletian mounted the imperial throne Anno Domini 284. At first he showed great favor to the Christians. In the year 286 he associated Maximian with him in the empire, and some Christians were put to death before any general persecution broke out. Among these were Felician and Primus, two brothers. Marcus and Marcellinius were twins, natives of Rome, and of noble descent. Their parents were heathens, but the tutors, to whom the education of the children was entrusted, brought them up as Christians. Their constancy at length subdued those who wished them to become pagans, and their parents and whole family became converts to a faith they had before reprobated. They were martyred by being tied to posts, and having their feet pierced with nails. After remaining in this situation for a day and a night, their sufferings were put an end to by thrusting lances through their bodies. Zo, the wife of the jailer, who had the care of the before-mentioned martyrs, was also converted by them, and hung upon a tree, 
with a fire of straw lighted under her. When her body was taken down, it was thrown into a river, with a large stone tied to it, in order to sink it. In the year of Christ, 286, a most remarkable affair occurred. A legion of soldiers, consisting of 6,666 men, contained none but Christians. This legion was called the Theban Legion, because the men had been raised in Thebes. They were quartered in the east, until the Emperor Maximian ordered them to march to Gaul, to assist him against the rebels of Burgundy. They passed the Alps into Gaul, under the command of Mauritius, Candidus, and Exupernis, their worthy commanders, and at length joined the emperor. Maximian, about this time, ordered a general sacrifice, at which the whole army was to assist, and likewise he commanded that they should take the oath of allegiance and swear, at the same time, to assist in the extirpation of Christianity in Gaul. Alarmed at these orders, each individual of the Theban legion absolutely refused either to sacrifice or take the oath be prescribed. This so greatly enraged Maximian that he ordered the legion to be decimated, that is, every tenth man to be selected from the rest and put to the sword. This bloody order having been put in execution, those who remained alive were still inflexible. When a second decimation took place, and every tenth man of those living was put to death. This second severity made no more impression than the first had done. The soldiers preserved their fortitude and their principles, but by the advice of their officers, they drew up a loyal remonstrance to the emperor. This, it might have been presumed, would have softened the emperor, but it had a contrary effect, for, enraged at their perseverance and unanimity, he commanded that the whole legion should be put to death, which was accordingly executed by the other troops, who cut them to pieces with their swords, September 22, 286. Alban, from whom St. Albans, in Hertfordshire, received its name, was the first British martyr. Great Britain had received the gospel of Christ from Lucius, the first Christian king, but did not suffer from the rage of persecution for many years after. He was originally a pagan, but converted by a Christian ecclesiastic named Amphibalus, whom he sheltered on account of his religion. The enemies of Amphibalus, having intelligence of the place where he was secreted, came to the house of Alban, in order to facilitate his escape. When the soldiers came, he offered himself up as the person they were seeking for. The deceit being detected, the governor ordered him to be scourged, and then he was sentenced to be beheaded, June the 22nd, Anno Domini 287. The Venerable Bede assures us that upon this occasion the executioner suddenly became a convert to Christianity, and entreated permission to die for Alban, or with him. Obtaining the latter request, they were beheaded by a soldier, who voluntarily undertook the task of the executioner. This happened on the 22nd of June, Anno Domini 287, at Verulam, now St. Albans, in Herefordshire, where a magnificent church was erected to his memory about the time of Constantine the Great. The edifice, being destroyed in the Saxon Wars, was rebuilt by Offa, king of Mercia, and a monastery erected adjoining to it, some remains of which are still visible, and the church is a noble Gothic structure. Faith, a Christian female of Aquitaine in France, was ordered to be broiled upon a gridiron, and then beheaded, Anno Domini 287. Quintin was a Christian and a native of Rome, but determined to attempt the propagation of the gospel in Gaul with one Lucian. They preached together in Amiens, after which Lucian went to Beaumaris, where he was martyred. Quintin remained in Picardy and was very zealous in his ministry. Being seized upon as a Christian, he was stretched with pulleys until his joints were dislocated. His body was then torn with wire scourges, and boiling oil and pitch poured on his naked flesh. Lighted torches were applied to his sides and armpits, and after he had been thus tortured, he was remanded back to prison, and died of the barbarities he had suffered. 31st of October, Anno Domini 287 his body was sunk in the Somme. 
the tenth persecution under diocletian anno domini three hundred and three under the roman emperors commonly called the era of the martyrs was occasioned partly by the increasing number and luxury of the christians and the hatred of galerius the adopted son of diocletian who being stimulated by his mother a bigoted pagan never ceased persuading the emperor to enter upon the persecution until he had accomplished his purpose the fatal day fixed upon to commence the bloody work was the twenty third of february anno domini three hundred and three that being the day in which the terminalia were celebrated and on which as the cruel pagans boasted they hoped to put a termination to christianity on the appointed day the persecution began in nicomedia on the morning of which the prefect of that city repaired with a great number of officers and assistants to the church of the christians where having forced open the doors they seized upon all the sacred books and committed them to the flames the whole of this transaction was in the presence of diocletian and galerius who not contented with burning the books had the church levelled with the ground this was followed by a severe edict commanding the destruction of all other christian churches and books and an order soon succeeded to render christians of all denominations outlaws the publication of this edict occasioned an immediate martyrdom for a bold christian not only tore it down from the place to which it was affixed but execrated the name of the emperor for his injustice a provocation like this was sufficient to call down pagan vengeance upon his head he was accordingly seized severely tortured and then burned alive all the christians were apprehended and imprisoned and galerius privately ordered the imperial palace to be set on fire that the christians might be charged as the incendiaries and a plausible pretense given for carrying on the persecution with the greater severities a general sacrifice was commenced which occasioned various martyrdoms no distinction was made of age or sex the name of christian was so obnoxious to the pagans that all indiscriminately fell sacrifices to their opinions many houses were set on fire and whole christian families perished in the flames and others had stones fastened about their necks and being tied together were driven into the sea the persecution became general in all the roman provinces but more particularly in the east and as it lasted ten years it is impossible to ascertain the numbers martyred or to enumerate the various modes of martyrdom racks scourges swords daggers crosses poison and famine were made use of in various parts to despatch the christians and invention was exhausted to devise tortures against such as had no crime but sinking differently from the waters of superstition a city of phrygia consisting entirely of christians was burned and all the inhabitants perished in the flames tired with slaughter at length several governors of provinces represented to the imperial court the impropriety of such conduct hence many were respited from execution but though they were not put to death as much as possible was done to render their lives miserable many of them having their ears cut off their noses slit their right eyes put out their limbs rendered useless by dreadful dislocations and their flesh seared in conspicuous places with red-hot irons it is necessary now to particularize the most conspicuous persons who laid down their lives in martyrdom in this bloody persecution sebastian a celebrated martyr was born at narbonne in gaul instructed in the principles of christianity at milan and afterward became an officer of the emperor's guard at rome he remained a true christian in the midst of idolatry unallured by the splendors of a court untamed by evil examples and uncontaminated by the hopes of preferment refusing to be a pagan the emperor ordered him to be taken to a field near the city termed the campus martius and there to be shot to death with arrows which sentence was executed accordingly some pious christians coming to the place of execution in order to give his body burial perceived signs of life in him and immediately moving him to a place of security they in a short time effected his recovery 
and prepared him for a second martyrdom, for as soon as he was able to go out, he placed himself intentionally in the emperor's way as he was going to the temple, and reprehended him for his various cruelties and unreasonable prejudices against Christianity. As soon as Diocletian had overcome his surprise, he ordered Sebastian to be seized, and carried to a place near the palace, and beaten to death, and that the Christian should not either use means again to recover or bury his body, he ordered that it should be thrown into the common sewer. Nevertheless, a Christian lady named Lucina found means to remove it from the sewer, and bury it in the catacombs, or repositories of the dead. End of chapter 2, part 3